In Lesson 5, we're continuing to work with the customer table. Okay, so we've seen how to add text fields. Let's add some non-text fields to our table. I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. You can add a whole bunch of different fields to a single table. I would say that most tables that I build personally end up having between 10 and 30 fields or so. You can have a lot more if you want, but if you find yourself starting to have more than 100 fields in a table, you probably are running into a situation where some of that data should be in a second table. Now we talk about multiple tables working together in the Access Expert classes. Yes, there is an upper limit to the number of fields you can have in a table, but realistically, in a real world database, you shouldn't ever hit it. Let's put in email address, just email is fine. I'm going to make this a hyperlink field. Now you can either drop this box down or you can just start typing in hyperlink, H, and there it is, hyperlink, tab, tab. This way I can put their email address in and then when I click on it in my database, it'll launch my email program and I can send them an email right from there. Similarly, website, make that a hyperlink. Okay, how about the person's phone number or just phone? Now you'd think you might want a number field for this because it's usually a number, but I'm going to go with short text. Same thing with postal code up here. In the United States, the postal code or the zip code is simply a five digit number. Why wouldn't I use a number field instead of a text field? There are several things to take into consideration when trying to decide whether to use a text or a number field. If you ever need to perform calculations on the field, use a number. Otherwise, use a text field. If you ever need to add two of them together, for example, or find the sum or average, then use a number. Do you ever need to add together a group of zip codes? No, probably not. Do you ever need to find the average of a phone number list? Nope. Use text. Might you want to find a customer with the greatest number of children? Yeah, you might. So for that, use a number field. Another factor to consider, the sort order. Numbers are sorted like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. 10, 11, and 12 come after 9. Text, on the other hand, sorts by the character. So 1 is followed by 1, 0, is followed by 1, 1, then 1, 2, then 2, and so on. So text is sorted alphanumerically, whereas numbers are sorted numerically. Does the field possibly contain a leading zero? Social security numbers, for example. The word number is right in the field name, social security number. That's a number for those of you who are outside the US that we use to track individuals. Sometimes they can start with a zero. So forgetting about the dashes, because you can store numbers and then format them later with dashes, but if you just want to store the characters, you might have a leading zero to consider. A zip code, for example, can start with a zero, so that's why you want to use a text field. Number fields will drop those leading zeros. So 02341 becomes just 2341. That's another consideration for when you'd want to use a text field. Another thing to consider is the value always a number, or could there possibly be text? If you get a phone number, like 1-800-Druidia, you'd have to find a phone and then say, okay, D is this, R is that, and put those numbers into your table. Otherwise, just let the user type in the text. Now, obviously, if you have some kind of an automated system, like fax numbers, and the database has to be able to send that directly to your fax software, then yeah, you might want to force only numbers. But generally, if it's just calling them from time to time, text is fine. So once again, with this new information at hand, I'm going to stick with short text for my phone number field. Next, I'd like to keep track of how many employees each of my customers has. Now, I'm building my database to be company-centric. In other words, each customer is a company. Let's say PC Resale is primarily a business-to-business -business organization. So I want to know how many employees this company has. So I'm going to put in num employees. Now you can put in number of employees or just employees. I find that 
num employees is short enough so that it's not a really long name, like number of employees. And if I just put in employees, that might not tell me enough information. So num employees, for me at least, is good enough to say that's the number of employees for this company. You can type it in however you want. Again, just try to maintain some consistency. This is going to be a number field because I may want to run a report later that says, show me a list of all of my customers with more than 50 employees. I couldn't do that with a text field. Or let's say I want to sort my list of customers based on the number of employees from high to low. You can't do that with a text field. So I'll go number. Now when it comes to number fields, you can specify what kind of number you want. Down here under field size, you'll see it says long integer. Let's click in here, then notice another drop down box appears. Click that drop down box and you'll see all the different types of numbers that are available to you. The default type is long integer, counting numbers basically, 0, 1, 2, 3, and they're negatives, negative 1, negative 2, and so on. Now sometimes you want to add decimal places to your number values. Long integers can't handle decimal places. For example, you might want to track the customer's discount rate. Maybe each customer has their own different discount. So that'll be a number field, but down here, you can't use long integer. A long integer won't let you store a value like 5.5%. Now there are a bunch of different types of numbers in here. There's byte, integer, single, double, replication, ID, decimal. For today, all I want you to worry about is long integer for counting type numbers and double for any numbers that require a decimal value. So for our discount rate, we're going to store that as double. So I can put a value like 5.5 in there. I will explain all the differences and the intricacies between these and when you want to use the different types of numbers in future classes. There are some pretty strange differences. Decimal, for example, seems like it's the one you want to use, but trust me, for now, use double. Next, I'd like to track how long each customer has been with me. So I can send a three-year discount coupon, for example. So I'm going to put customer since in the next field. Customer since. This is going to be a date time field. Just press D for date time field. Remember, a date time field can store a date, a time, or both. Let's keep track of each customer's credit limit. That will be a currency value. Currency is a special type of number value that is optimized for dealing with dollars and cents, or whatever your local currency happens to be. How about that value that I briefly mentioned earlier, is active? This will be a yes-no value. Again, does that mean the customer likes to exercise? No, that means the customer is on our mailing list, for example. Let's add in a notes field. This will be a long text field, formerly memo. It's good to have notes fields in most of your tables. They don't use a lot of space if you don't put data in them. So for most things like customers or products or vendors or orders even, I generally tend to have a notes field in there somewhere where you can type in extra notes about that thing. Now we're going to skip some of these types for now, like OLE object, for example. That's good if you want to put, let's say, a customer's picture in the database. That way you can print it on his name tag. Or you can use an attachment field to store his resume as a Word document right in the employee's record. We'll talk about calculated fields and lookup wizards in future classes. But there is still one bit of data that we're missing. We still don't have a way to uniquely identify each customer. And that is what the auto number field is for. Auto number, remember, is a number that Access keeps track of. It will start at 1 and automatically increment them for each record that you add to the table. You don't have to worry about it. It happens in the background. So let's create an auto number field, and I'm going to call this my customer ID, customer identifier. Almost every table that I design is going to have an ID field in it. There are very few exceptions. 
Auto numbers are very important when it comes to relating information from one table to another. For example, each customer might have multiple orders. How do you know which customer each order belongs to? You're going to put the customer ID in the order record. Now we're not going to cover relationships until our expert series later on, but just keep that in mind for now. We need that ID field to uniquely identify each record in the table. The other fields in here aren't really good at identifying customers. I could have a hundred Johns and even six John Smiths. Phone numbers can change from time to time. Even values like social security number aren't good. So when it comes to setting up relationships in your database, trust me and stick with auto numbers. You can have other fields if you want to. Let's say you've got an old paper system or an old system you set up in Excel and you've assigned IDs to your customers. That's fine. You can add that as a second field for your own purposes. But for the database, for access, to keep track of those unique customers, set up an auto number field. Auto numbers never change and access maintains the list for you. Auto numbers never get reused. So if you delete customer four, you never have to worry about another customer four appearing and then accidentally assuming customer four's orders. That could never happen. Your users can't edit auto numbers. They can't be changed. So it's the perfect field to keep track of unique customers with. Now you don't ever have to even worry about these auto numbers. If you want to see them on your forms and reports, if you want to print a customer ID, you can, that's fine. But you don't have to. You can leave them completely in the background. Properly built, each table in your database will have its own ID field. So the customer table has customer ID. The order table will have an order ID. The product table will have a product ID, and so on. There are very few exceptions to this rule. Most tables that I build will get an ID field. Now, as a matter of personal preference, I like to keep the ID fields up at the top of the list of fields. Usually when I start building a table, the first thing that I do is put the auto number in. But I showed it to you this way so I can teach you how to move fields around. I'm tricky like that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to click on this little gray box over here on the left-hand side of the field that selects or highlights the entire row. Now, let your mouse go so it's not clicked anymore. Then, with the arrow here, click and drag to move this field up to the top of the list, way up the top, right above first name, and then let it go. That's all. That's how you can move these fields around. If you decide you want email up top, just click on it and drag it up where you want it, like right on top of first name. I'll put it back where it was. Click and then drag down here, right there. You can move these fields in any order that you want, and it really doesn't matter to access what order these fields are in. I just like having the IDs up top. Okay, so now we're done building our table for now. Let's save this table to the database. Now, nothing we've done yet is saved, so if we were to somehow lose the power, all of our work is gone. So let's hit the Save button right up here in the Quick Access Toolbar. Notice the tooltip that pops up says you can also press Control S on your keyboard. Get in the habit of doing that. That also works in Word and in Excel. Hit Control S whenever you think about it to save your document. Yeah, Word and Excel have that auto recover feature where it saves automatically for you, but I still like to get in the habit of hitting Control S. It goes back to the days before auto recover. So I'll hit save. You're asked for a table name. Now table one is an awful name. It doesn't tell you anything about the data in the table. So I'm going to call mine customer T with a capital T on the end. Again, no spaces. I like to end all of my table names in T, my queries with a Q, my forms with an F, my reports with an R. Again, this is just a personal naming convention, and I've been doing it this way for many, many years now, going back to the early versions of Access. When you build a report or a form, Access lets you base that form or report on a table or query. Where are you getting the data from? Well, the older versions of Access didn't used to tell you whether it was a table or a query. It would just show you one big long list that had all the tables and queries together in it. So if you had a customer table and a customer query, you didn't know which one was which. You had to guess. So I started putting customer T, putting T's on all the end of my tables, and Q's on all the end of my queries. 
You may also see this in some books, TBL customer. Same thing, it's that Hungarian notation again. Table customer just tells you it's the customer table. Personally, I prefer it this way. You can do it whatever way you want. Here's a hint though. If you're planning on watching a lot of my courses, stick with my naming convention, otherwise you might get confused later on. Also, I tend to keep my customer table names singular so that later on, if I'm writing a macro or doing some VB programming, I don't have to think to myself, oh, was it customer table or customer's table? So I try to avoid plural table names. Again, just another tip. And I'm mentioning this stuff now to get you in the habit of doing it because changing all your table names later is a bit of a pain. So I've got customer T in the save as box. I'm gonna hit okay. And now I get this warning message. It says there is no primary key defined. What does that mean? It says although a primary key isn't required, it's highly recommended. A table must have a primary key for you to define relationships between this table and other tables in the database. Do you want to create a primary key now? Essentially, the primary key is that one unique value that each table has that lets you uniquely identify each record. Now, we put that in there, right? We made that ID field, that auto number, but we didn't tell Access that it was the primary key. If you look, there's a button right up here on the ribbon that says primary key. I almost never remember to click that button before I save the table. So Access yells at me and it says, hey, you forgot to define your primary key. Do you want to create the primary key now? Just say yes. Now what happens is Access looks at your table and it says, does he have an auto number? If so, Access makes that the primary key for you. See the little key symbol right there next to customer ID? Access took care of us. If you didn't have an auto number already in your table, Access adds one for you and just calls it ID. In any case, I showed it to you this way because that always happens to me. I build a table, I hit save, and then I get the error message. Oh, there's no primary key defined. Do you want to make one now? Yeah, sure. You can make it yourself by simply clicking on the primary key button. But again, I almost never do that. Now the primary key forces this value to never have duplicates, and it sets up something called indexing, which speeds up searches and sorts. And we'll talk a lot more about indexing in future lessons. You can index other fields too, like first name or last name. That way if you run a lot of reports, for example, customer lists sorted by last name. If you index the last name, it makes that report run much, much faster. Indexing is a topic for a whole other lesson, and we'll cover that soon. Okay, so now I'm done designing this table. So I'm going to close it by clicking on the little X here in the upper right corner. That's the close button for the table. Now you can see over on the left here, there's the customer T in the navigation pane. If you want to make more design changes to it, right click on it and select Design View. That will open it back up in Design View. Again, I'll close it. When you're ready to put data in the table, double click on it and that will open the table up into Data Sheet View. In the next lesson, we'll start putting data into our table.